Can we take images of the moon with a small 61 millimeter refractor? Let's find out. All right, after weeks of cloudiness, it's finally clear. Now, I wanted to go to the observatory and utilize some of the moonless sky that's supposed to happen after 1 a.m. tonight, but I can't. The driveway to the observatory I want to go to is not plowed and my little car can't make it. So tonight what we're going to do is use the William Optics ZS61 and my DSLR and just see what we can do with this half moon. Now I'm going to be trying a few different things with a Barlow and uh, digital zoom just to see what we can do and I'll be doing some video and a few still frames. So let's get started. Okay, so some of you may have noticed that I have the ASI Air still attached. I basically just store it that way. Uh, when I take it inside, I just set it inside and throw a cover sheet over it just to keep dust and everything off. Um, but for now, just using the SenseCan controller is nice. Plus, I'm just leaving that on there for the counterbalance with the uh, weight. But for now, uh, we'll just use the SenseCan controller. It's easier. My iPad that I use to control everything tends to die in this cold weather. So we're just gonna roll with it as it is. Oh, and beyond that, the only other thing we have to do is I have to give this maybe 10 more minutes to cool down. Uh, you do need to let your gear cool down in cold weather or warm up if uh, it's the middle of summer and just make it match the ambient temperature. That way, dew is less of a problem. Now I have dew heaters, so it's kind of fine, but still, um, let it cool down. I'm gonna get the dew heaters running and then we're gonna get it going. Okay, so we are now shooting on the moon. No zoom whatsoever. We're doing the raw files first. Uh, as soon as this is done, we'll do a, a minute of video and we'll see which one uh, works there. So it is at ISO 100 and the frame speed, the uh, shutter speed is uh, 1 250th of a second. Uh, after this, I'm going to do double zoom and uh, do the same thing, 400 pictures and then a minute of video. And we'll see which ones come out better. And then I'll zoom it one more time. I'm gonna go only as far as I can to fill the frame. And then maybe do one at times 10 just to get some craters. All right, we are back inside and warm. So a few things here. The batteries ended up dying on me after I got the um, video at three times zoom. I did take one more at 10 times zoom just to get in on some features of the moon. But hey, that's what happens when it's cold out, so. Uh, we didn't get a chance to use the Barlow because of the batteries dying out. I will go back and try again when it's warm out and batteries just last a little bit longer. Another thing I did find out was that digital zoom only works with video. It does not work with still images, at least with this camera. That's okay, that's part of the learning curve. Okay, so three more things and then we'll get started on processing. The first one is all of the programs that we'll be using, because we're going to bounce between a few, are linked down in the description. If you need to, pause the video, go download those programs and then come back. Keep in mind that these are for Windows and not Mac. Some of them aren't available on both platforms. So for the purposes of the tutorial, we're going to use the three and a half times zoom video that I shot. Uh, if you want to, down in the description in the Google Drive link is a copy of that if you want to practice using that or you can just follow along with whatever it is you have taken. And the last thing here is if you like what you see as you're watching, go ahead and give this video the big old thumbs up and let's start with virtual dub. All right, so when you're working with video from a DSLR, you need to convert it from the default MP4 file that it puts out and put it into an uncompressed AVI. Think of this as the difference between processing raw image files versus processing JPEGs. RAWs have all the data, JPEGs don't. All right, so in virtual dub, go ahead and go to file, then open video file, 
and then just go to the video that uh, you have taken and just open it up. Okay, once it's open, it's real simple. All you have to do is just go back to file and then save video. And the one thing you want to make sure is that you change the file type to audio video interleave and then just make sure down at the bottom here that it states that it's uncompressed. From there, you can name it whatever you want. If you feel like renaming it, I just like to change it to whatever it is. So moon three times and then just go ahead and hit save. And this takes a few minutes. So once it's done, we are gonna move over into PIP. So while this is processing, I do wanna warn you that this file is going to be huge. One minute of video comes out to about 12 gigabytes. After you're done processing this and the image is saved exactly how you like it, I would recommend at least saving the video that you got straight out of the camera and then get rid of some of the processing stuff if you don't have a lot of space to store all of your data. If you have tons of space, hey, more power to you, go ahead and save it. Okay, so in PIP, what we want to do is click Add Image Files, and then just click on that AVI that we just saved in Virtual Dub. It'll bring up a nifty little preview window. Uh, we can kind of ignore it because we don't really need to use much from it. But the things that we do want to do is, if you were doing a full view of the moon or using the file that I gave you, then you'll want to check uh, solar lunar full disk. If you are doing something that's more like a moon feature, say you're zoomed in on a couple craters, then you want to do solar slash lunar close up. And yes, this also applies for solar imaging as well. So the input options tab, we really don't have to do anything with, so we can just skip over that and then go to the processing options tab. Now in here, there are a few things that you do want to do. If you're like me and you enjoy the images of the moon where the mineral colors are pulled out, you will want to uncheck convert color to monochrome. If you like the black and white images, then go ahead and leave that checked. The other thing that you're gonna want to do is make sure center object in each frame is checked. And then for the purposes of this video, we're gonna uncheck enable cropping. Now, if you are doing a planet, because this also works doing planetary videos, and you want to uh, just get a little bit closer in, then yes, you can crop. Uh, just make sure you offset. But for this, we'll ignore it. The other thing here is if you want to use the, the finished image as, say, a phone wallpaper, you probably want to uh, rotate it a little bit as well. So for me, I do. And uh, I will go ahead and down in the flip and rotate, just click rotate 90 degrees anti-clockwise. That way the orientation is correct for how the moon actually looked in the sky to me. All right, moving on to the quality options tab. The only thing that we really want to do is make sure that enable quality estimation is checked because it will help out with picking out the best frames and also list that in the file name when it's done processing. And the other thing is that we want to keep only the best quality frames. Now looking over in the preview window, you can see frame number one of 2,134. So for your video, you might have more or less frames, but we only need to keep a few of them. However, just keep in mind that you can change the number uh, as lit to as little frames or as many frames, maybe you want to keep 80% of the frames, um, which you can change that to a percentage. But I like keeping the number, and for this, 1200 frames is actually pretty good to, to work with. So we'll go ahead and set it to the default of 1200. Uh, we can skip over animation options because we're not doing an animation and then go to output options. Now here you want to make sure that it is saved as a TIFF. Basically the same thing as saving it as a raw camera file. Uh, the output directory, I leave that as default because it saves it in the same folder that we pulled the video from and let it create a subdirectory. It just helps with organization, at least in my opinion, it's very good for that. I like how it adds pip to the name of the file and make sure include quality value in file name. That way you can kind of see just how good each um, individual frame came out. The last thing we do is go over to the do processing tab and then just hit start processing. Now this takes a while, so if you need to go refill a drink or maybe let the dog out, you know, whatever the case is, go ahead and do that and just hit start processing. All right, it is done. Let's go ahead and go and check out the output folder. 
Now, it saves a log, which we can kind of ignore. If you want to dig in to see what they're all about, you can, but we want to look at the images themselves. So if you notice here, uh, it saves the top one as 100% and then everything else below that all the way down to 96.41% out of 1200 frames that's pretty good keeping a pretty high threshold above 95% okay so what we want to do is go ahead and move into auto stacker all right once you are in auto stacker all you have to do is click open and then go ahead and find the folder with those files by default it will have all supported video formats as the files of type. You wanna change that to image files and you will see all uh, 1200 or however many you saved uh, in the folder. Just click on one of them and then hit Control and A at the same time so it selects everything in the folder and then just click Open. And much like Pip, we have a little preview window which is pretty cool to see. So the few options that we need to check over here in the left side is pretty much leave it default. You don't need to change anything. Uh, just go ahead and click analyze. And we're back to waiting again, so I will go ahead and use the magic of editing and move us on to when it's done. All right, so now that we are done analyzing, there's a few things you're gonna wanna pay attention to. And the first is the quality graph. So the quality graph has these uh, vertical lines and each one is 25% quality. So the middle is 50%. And the same thing with the horizontal lines, at the top is 100 and the bottom is zero. So if you pay attention to the green line here, that is the quality of each and every frame that we pulled out using PIP. My recommendation is if this green line at all crosses the middle where both 50% line up, anything to the right, don't use it. And then just change the frame percentage to stack to lower than 50%. However, because of how this green line li lines up, using about 80% seems to work out pretty well because these last few frames here, if you notice when you do any motion here, that stretch that happens right there, that's the last few frames. So we can just ignore that and use 80% of the frames and it'll all be sharp. Over on the right edge of the screen, I'm just gonna leave it at the default 80%. Uh, don't worry about sharpening here, we will sharpen in the next program. Go ahead and do RGB align that aligns the histogram. This program does a pretty good job at lining it up. We will tweak it a little bit more uh, in the next few steps, but for now, go ahead and use that. If you want to, you can change the name by clicking on the stack name options and change it to whatever you want. However, the automatic naming works out pretty well, at least in my opinion. The last thing here is drizzle. If the image is small, you can check drizzle. It will help sharpen the image a bit, and this helps because using a DSLR, uh, zoomed in like this, the chip does undersample it a little bit. And going back over to the slider, if you notice there's a little bit of movement and this acts exactly like dithering does when you're doing a deep sky object and you dither. With the undersampling and the little bit of motion, this will work and as long as those two conditions are met, the only other thing that we have to worry about for Drizzle to actually be worth it is that we have a lot of data and we do using 1200 frames. I will be using the three times Drizzle, uh, but I encourage you to play around and play with it off and at 1.5 and just see which one you like more. Just remember, it is your image. All right, and the last thing we need to do before stacking is over on the the right hand side go ahead and place your AP grid now if you have it at 24 you will see that there are just tons of auto stack points and that'll make this thing take forever we don't need that many I'm gonna select 104 and anytime you're stacking an auto stacker as long as it looks about like this you should be fine after that go ahead and just click stack all right we have a stacked image so if we go to the folder where it saved everything uh, you'll notice that this is the pip folder, and if you click on this ASP80, that's what Auto Stacker did, and here is our stacked image. All right, and you can check it out, and you'll see that it looks very good. However, in some spots, it's not exactly sharp yet, but that's okay. We're gonna go ahead and move into Registax. All right, once we are in Registax, go ahead and go to Select and then just open up that image that we just put together in Auto Stacker. 
And then in this little pop-up, you can go ahead and just click no. If you want to, you can check that box, but uh, I just leave it alone. And this takes a few seconds to open up because it does have to process a large file. So we'll just give it a minute. All right, once it's open, one thing I like to do is check show full image up at the top. And that just helps with keeping an eye on everything. The other thing we're gonna wanna do is click on show processing area. So go ahead and click on the Stevenus crater, or if you're doing somewhere else on the moon, just pick one of the craters where it's real bright and white around the crater. And the reason being is that we're going to stretch a little bit, but we don't wanna blow that area out. The first thing we will do is click RGB balance. Now it should be pretty balanced, but it might be a little bit off as well. And then just hit auto balance. And that's all we're doing there. You can go ahead and close out of that window. And then the next thing we're going to do is click on histogram. From here, all we're doing is pulling the whites in just a little bit, but we don't want to clip it. So we'll pull it in to say that line there and then just hit stretch. And you'll notice that the preview area is a little bit more visible now. And just keep pulling it in just a little bit until the white around the crater seems to be blown out. Nope, too far. Okay, and you can always reset just in case and then pull it back in again. And what we're doing here is just pulling it in to where we still have a little bit of room to stretch the whites, but not a whole lot. And that is so when we take it into Photoshop here in a little bit, we have some room to work with. So we'll go ahead and stretch it there. And that looks fine to me. And then just close this window out. So for the next step, click on some of the craters somewhere around the terminus, just anywhere where you can see some shadows and some detail. Now here we're gonna sharpen it up. So I like to just mess around with all of the sliders and just get it to sharpen up a little bit. And I like to pull all of them just a little bit. And if you see zooming, if you see, uh, how sharp it ends up looking looks pretty good and if you zoom in a lot yes you'll see the pixels but it looks pretty good to me all right and just play around with the sliders and make sure you denoise a little bit to smooth it out but don't go overboard just play around it looks so it looks like it's sharp but not over processed all right once you are fine with how it looks the next thing you'll do is just click do all All right, so now that it is done, you can see that the histogram has been stretched and all of the craters and everything look a lot sharper than they used to. If you are not okay with this, you can keep playing with the sliders and just do a little bit more and do all again. If not, you can go ahead and just save the image. And what I like to do is just save it in the same folder, but just add sharpened to the name. From here, all we do is take it into Photoshop. All right, here we are in Photoshop. And the first thing we're gonna do is go ahead and crop it. And we'll wanna change the aspect ratio to four by five or eight by 10. And this works if you are going to say post it on Instagram or maybe even just put it as the uh, background for your phone. Uh, we'll go ahead and center it up and just hit enter and there we go. From here, there are only a few tweaks that we need to do. So we're gonna go to filter and then camera raw filter. All right, in here, we're only gonna do a few tweaks. So we're gonna bump up the exposure just a tad, just to brighten things up just a little bit. Nah, that's too far, we'll go there. And we're gonna take the contrast up just a little bit. Oh, too far, we'll say three works. and just go through and just tweak everything. So we'll do the highlights, the shadows, the whites, the blacks, the texture, the clarity, everything. Everything in here, just leave the temperature and tint alone. Okay, so if you're like me and like pulling the colors of the minerals out, then you're gonna want to up the saturation and the vibrance. So I recommend cranking the saturation and then just play with the vibrance slider just a little bit. So that way it gets to just what you like. Remember, this is your image. So play around with it and see what you like. Okay, so the other thing we can do is go down to the curves. And then if you 
go at the very edge of the blacks and just pull it down just a tad. That'll help pull out a few of those colors. All right, one last thing that we're gonna wanna do in here is go to Color Mixer and then click on Saturation and then just pull up the oranges. And that helps pull out the colors even more. And you can do just a little bit of red. You don't wanna really crank the red, but you know, maybe about halfway. And then a little bit with the blues. And that really helps just pull out the colors of the moon. And you can also do a little bit with luminance if you want. And just play around a little bit more and get the colors that you want. And then hit OK. OK, and then the last thing we will do is go to Sharpen and then Smart Sharpen. All right, from here we can see that it is already pretty sharp. However, we do wanna do a little bit more and we're actually just gonna crank the crap out of it. And then we're going to balance it out by removing some of the noise. And then just hit OK. All right, I am happy with this image as it is, so I'll go ahead and save it now. However, if you are well versed in Photoshop and wanna keep playing around with it, that's your call. This is the basics of getting a moon image from video. Now I do have a question for you. Did you use my video or did you use one of your own? Let me know down in the comments and then let's see what it was that you came up with. I wanna see that image. If you found this video helpful, please do give this one a like and then maybe consider subscribing, it's your call. And if you do hit that little notification bell so that way YouTube does tell you when I upload the next video. I wanna thank you for watching, clear skies.